Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word, presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. An umpire named Babe Pinelli once called Babe Ruth out on strikes. When the crowd booed with sharp disapproval at the call, the legendary Ruth turned to the umpire with disdain and said, there's 40,000 people here who know that the last pitch was a ball. Suspecting that the umpire would erupt with anger, the coaches and players braced themselves for Ruth's ejection. However, the cool-headed Pinelli replied, maybe so, babe, but mine is the only opinion that counts. We need to realize that the Lord's opinion of us and His judgment at the judgment seat of Christ is the only one that counts. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, the Apostle Paul wrote that we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Looking at the judgment seat of Christ through the eye of faith is to look at something eternal. It has eternal ramifications. In our lives, we should look at and live in light of this judgment day by faith, knowing that there is a day coming when we will stand before our Lord to give an account of our Christian lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9 says, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Wherefore, Paul says, what Paul says in this verse is in relation to what he previously said in chapter 5. And so, in light of being absent from the body and present with the Lord, and the certainty of our eternal hope and eternal purpose, Paul says, wherefore, we labor. Labor here means an, an aim or an ambition to make something a point of constant effort, to strive after it. Paul had a strong ambition for something, as he says, whether present or absent. Now, Paul has already used those words in verses 6 and 8 when he talked about being at home or present in the body and being absent from the Lord. And then in verse 8, about being absent from the body and being present with the Lord. What Paul is saying here is whether he was living here in this life in my physical body, at home, present in my body, or whether he died and was absent from the body but present with the Lord, in either case, his ambition was the same. In Paul's aim, his point of constant effort that he strove hard for was that we may be accepted of him. In Ephesians 1, 6, the word accepted means to be graced, highly favored, endued with special honor. Our acceptance and high favor by the Father is based on His grace, it's based on the shed blood of Christ, and it's based on our position of being in Christ. We are fully accepted in Christ for all eternity. Here, the word accepted is a completely different Greek word, which means acceptable and well-pleasing. It's translated this way in other places. And in those passages, we learn of the things that are well-pleasing and acceptable to God that we should make our aim and strive hard after in life. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says it is acceptable to God when we present our bodies as a living sacrifice for Him. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, same word, unto God, which is your reasonable service. Ephesians 5.10 teaches that we are to be proving what is acceptable, same word here, unto the Lord. Colossians 3.20 says, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing, same word as verse 9 here, unto the Lord. Hebrews 13, 20 to 21 says, Now the God of peace make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing. Same word, in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. 
The Lord reveals by His Word what is well-pleasing to Him. Trusting the Word, obeying it, applying it, rightly dividing it, all of that pleases Him. Living by faith, being faithful to God's truth for the body of Christ under grace is well-pleasing to Him as well. Paul's purpose and constant aim, what, he, what drove him and motivated him, was to live a life well-pleasing to God. He had a deep desire for his life and his service here on this earth to be acceptable to his Savior. But Paul's life did not lack focus or care. He wasn't indifferent. He lived a very focused life for the Lord. As long as he was here, present in this body, his aim was to please his Lord. He was careful about how he lived his life, careful to live in light of eternity, careful to serve his Lord, careful to make every effort to use his life to the fullest to please him. Our motivation, too, for faithful labor should be a desire to please our Lord with our words, our thoughts, and our actions. We should have this, like Paul, as our highest goal as well. The thought of living a life well-pleasing to him and being absent from the body, then, and present with the Lord, leads Paul into his next subject, that when he stands before the Lord one day at the judgment seat of Christ, Paul wanted the Lord to be well pleased with him at that day. You see the connecting word in verse 10, the word for, at the beginning of verse 10, for we must all appear, right after he talks about living a life that is acceptable to him. The knowledge that he would give an account of his life and service before the Lord someday elevated Paul's sense of devotion to him, knowing that he would stand before him one day to give an account. It heightened his desire to please the Lord. He wanted the Lord to be well pleased with him at that day when he stood before him at the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Often the judgment seat of Christ is confused with the great white throne judgment. The great white throne is the judgment of all unbelievers of all ages when they are judged for their sinful works and then cast into the lake of fire. The judgment seat of Christ, however, is a believer's judgment only. When Paul says, we must all appear, he's writing to a group of believers, and he's writing to the church, the body of Christ. So putting that together, the judgment seat of Christ is a judgment for believers who are in the church, the body of Christ. Israel will have their own judgment one day prior to the establishment of the millennial kingdom. But this judgment... The judgment seat of Christ is only for the body of Christ. The judgment seat does not decide whether or not we go to heaven. Whether we trust that Christ died for our sins and rose again in this life is what determines whether we go to heaven or not. If we trust Christ as our Savior, there is no concern about our eternal destiny. Scripture says our life is hid with Christ in God and that nothing will ever separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. It is inevitable that every member of the body of Christ will and must stand before the judgment seat. It says, for we must all appear. And this judgment takes place when we are already in heaven. The phrase command performance came into usage during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, when she called for a theatrical performance. The idea behind that phrase is that when a monarch or a royalty commands a performance, it cannot be refused. Here, Paul declares that we must appear. This is an imperative. We have no choice but to appear. We cannot refuse. The reason to live a life pleasing to the Lord is because we must appear before the Lord one day. Every believer is going to appear before the Lord, and now is the time to prepare for that day that is coming one day. We must all appear, Paul says. It means that this command to appear includes not only the Apostle Paul himself, but all of us in the body of Christ as well. 
No one is excluded. No one is exempt. We're all going to be there. Romans 14, 10 and 12 says, We, the body of Christ, shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us shall give account of himself to God. We will each individually give an account. No one else is going to stand there with you. Your spouse won't be there with you. Your, chi your children won't. Your parents won't. Your friends won't. Your pastor won't stand there with you. It'll be just you and the Lord. We are each individually accountable before God for what we believe and how we live and will individually have to answer for it before the Lord someday. He will call your name. Paul's ambition was driven by the reality that there is going to be an accounting for what he has done in his body. Paul knew that he was heading for a, and facing a monumental event one day and not only him, but everyone in the body of Christ. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Exploring the Unsearchable Riches of Christ is a hardcover 190-page book written by Pastor Paul M. Sadler. The purpose of this book is to establish the reader in God's message for the church, the body of Christ, during this present age of grace. The content of this volume has been developed over a 25-year period, and we pray it may help you enjoy the Word of God in a deeper sense. It clearly transformed this author's life when he first came to a knowledge of the Word, rightly divided. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. One commentator insightfully said this, a clear and compelling vision of the future does have real power to affect our actions in the present. Think of the student who stands to get a scholarship if he can achieve a certain SAT score next month. Think of the bride-to-be who wants to fit into her wedding gown in six weeks. Think of the hard-working couple who's absolutely committed to the goal of retiring by age 60. The Apostle Paul was riveted by the reality of eternity, and the judgment seat of Christ helped him shape his behavior. By cultivating a mindset that continually recalls easy-to-forget realities, we become the people God made us to be and our lives take on new power and purpose. When the rapture happens, the whole body of Christ is going to be in heaven. And it's at this time that the Lord will judge the body at the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. And that appearing is the rapture of the church. One day, the body of Christ is going to disappear without a trace at the rapture of the church. This could happen at any time. So we need to be prepared always. Every day, the rapture could occur. And right on the heels of the rapture, after the appearing of Christ, the body of Christ will then appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The word appear here in verse 10 means to make manifest, to reveal, make fully known. The judgment seat of Christ is not just a matter of appearing there, but of being made manifest. When we stand before the Lord, our lives and our service, they will be revealed, made manifest, made fully clear. The judgment seat will be a place of revelation. The judgment seat will reveal our lives and our service for Christ exactly as they have been. 
Everything we have done will be revealed by the Lord. Not only the amount of our service, but its quality and the very motives, the beliefs, the attitudes that prompted it, motivated it all will be revealed and reviewed by our Lord. We're going to be thoroughly evaluated. The Lord is all-knowing. He knows every single detail about our lives. We're not going to be telling the Lord what we did for Him. He'll be telling us what we did for Him. He knows what we've done and why we did it. Because God looks at the heart and He will reveal the truth about what was done by Him and for Him and what was not. And we will find out the real verdict for our lives, the real verdict for our service. A boss caught Calvin sitting at the desk staring out the window. Why aren't you working, Calvin? Without much thought, Calvin was stunned to be caught by the boss and he confessed, because I didn't see you coming. The Lord sees all that we do. He will show us what He sees. The judgment seat will be a time when the Lord will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God, 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says. The word judgment seat here is the word bima in the Greek. In its simplest definition, that word means a place reached by steps. In ancient Greek culture, the bima was an elevated platform in towns where speeches were made and where magistrates sat to administer justice and their judgments were made and decisions were handed down. You even see that in the book of Acts. In Acts 18 in Corinth, Paul was drugged before the judgment seat and was falsely accused of persuading men to worship God contrary to their laws. And think about our Lord in John 19.13 when the Lord was brought before Pontius Pilate. It says, When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat. The Bema was a place for making judgments. And the Bema was also a place where awards and crowns were handed out to athletes where the winners in the sporting er arena uh, received their reward. So it was a place for both making judgments and giving rewards. And that's exactly what the judgment seat of Christ is all about. The Lord will judge our life, He'll judge our service and our motives, and He'll reward it or not reward it accordingly. Paul calls it the judgment seat of Christ. John 5.22 says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, we are going to be judged by the Son of God, by our Lord, and by our Savior. The judgment seat is the elevated place where our Lord will sit in judgment of us and render the evaluation of our life. He will be seated in an elevated place. We will be in His presence and we will stand before Him. At that day, every one of us in the body will be judged for the things done in our bodies, Paul says. The judgment seat is a judgment of the journey of the Christian life. We're not judged for what was done before we were saved, but for our service, our life, our stand for the truth, our conduct after we were saved. In 2 Corinthians 5, this chapter here, Paul longed for his resurrected, glorified body. But he also remembered that what we do in these bodies now, in this life, matters for all eternity. It affects the glorification of our future eternal glorified bodies. What we, what we do in this body, in this life, is going to matter. And it's going to be the issue in that judgment. This earthly body has an impact on eternity. It's the vehicle through which deeds can be done of eternal value for the Lord. The true character of our works and service done in these bodies will be revealed by Christ. He will reveal whether our works have been good, with a good motive, and through Christ and for Christ, with eternal value. And He will reveal whether our service has been bad or worthless, with a bad motive for self, not for the Lord, and with no lasting value. Scripture is clear that God has a system of rewards that will be handed out at this day. Our reigning position, the light and glory of our glorified bodies, 
inheritance, authority, crowns, all of this is going to be decided at this judgment for eternity. Just by people looking at you, people will know how much we allowed the Lord to use our lives, how faithful we were based on the rewards that will be ours for all eternity. And all of it's going to be to the glory of our Savior. It's been said that no good thing done in His name and for His glory can pass His notice or fail to receive His blessing. Hebrews 6.10 says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which ye have showed toward His name. God does not forget any good thing we've done for Him in our lives and we're going to be rewarded for it at that day. He'll bring out things we'll probably be shocked about because we completely forgot that we even did that little thing uh, for the Lord. The rewards at the judgment seat, though, are all grace because the service that we're going to be rewarded for is when we yield and surrender to Him and we allow the Lord to do the work through us and He receives the glory. And so what you have with the rewards is God does the work through us and we receive the reward. We don't deserve that. And that is grace. There is a reason why the Lord waits to judge us and why He doesn't judge us immediately when we get to heaven. Because often the impact of our lives and our influence and our service goes on and on and on through the people we've loved, through the people we've reached, touched, impacted through our lives, through the memory of our lives and what we leave behind. And we'll be rewarded for this because the all-knowing Lord knows all of this. Christ is the perfect judge, and He has perfect knowledge of every single person. He knows the big picture of our lives, and He knows how far, how wide the influence of our lives reaches. One wet and miserable morning in Ohio, Ray Blankenship was making breakfast when he looked out the window onto the open stormwater drain that ran alongside his house. What he saw terrified him, a small girl being swept down the drain. He also knew that further downstream, the ditch disappeared with a roar underneath the road. Ray ran out the door, raced along the ditch, trying to get ahead of the little girl. Then he just hurled himself into the deep, churning water. He surfaced, was able to grab the child's arm, they tumbled end over end within about three feet of the drain going under the road. Ray's free hand felt something protruding from the bank. He grabbed a hold of it and held on for dear life. If I can just hang on until help comes, he thought, but he did better than that. By the time the fire department rescuers arrived, Ray had pulled the girl to safety. Both were treated for shock. On April 12, 1989, Ray Blankenship was awarded the U.S. Coast Guard Silver Life-Saving Medal. The award is fitting. Ray Blankenship was at even greater risk to himself than most people knew because Ray couldn't swim. Stepping out in faith, doing the things we can't through the Lord, and we just trust the Lord for it, we're going to be rewarded for those type of things at the judgment seat. Faithfulness pleases the Lord. Being a good and faithful father, a faithful mother, a faithful spouse, a faithful employee, all of that pleases the Lord and we're gonna be rewarded for that. Being faithful to the church, faithful as a testimony for the Lord by our conduct, faithful to stand for the truth of the word, faithful to pray for other people. God rewards faithfulness. He is pleased by that. And He will recognize faithfulness and He will reward these type of things in our lives. Paul says we will receive for the things done in our bodies or be recompensed for the things that we did. The Lord will give back what is due. He will justly honor and recognize our service for Him. Alexander McLaren writes, The judgment seat is meant for us, real and imperfect Christians. And it tells us that there are degrees in that future blessedness proportioned to present faithfulness. 
And I don't think the judgment seat is only a pep rally or an awards ceremony like the Academy Awards for rewards. There will be a full range of emotions in that day. There's going to be joy in receiving reward. And there will be regret at the loss we suffer in that day of what could have been. That's going to be true of every single person. We are all imperfect on this side of heaven, and we all will wish that we had done more for our Savior. But the most important thing at the judgment seat will not be the rewards themselves that we may receive. It will be that the Lord was so pleased with this one thing I did for Him that He desires to honor me for all eternity because He was well pleased by it. That will mean everything to know that our Lord was pleased with us. This text reminds each of us of the importance to examine our lives regularly, to see if we are living a life acceptable and well-pleasing to God, and if we are ready to stand at the judgment seat of Christ, which could happen at any time. We will never regret giving it our all and holding nothing back and living for the Lord. For eternity we'll be glad we did, and especially because we'll stand and we'll give account before the one who gave his all for us and dying for our sins and rising again to save us and give us eternal life. If you ever have any questions about the things you hear on this program or read with our literature, please contact us anytime at Breen Bible Society. Our phone number is 262-255-4750. Our email is berean at bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you for watching Transformed by Grace. Next time we're going to be examining all the future judgments before the Lord. Two Minutes with the Bible is a timeless classic that our beloved founder, C.R. Stamm, compiled from newspaper articles he had written for various publications. We at the Berean Bible Society are firm believers in the importance of daily devotions to further spiritual growth. What better way to show our appreciation for all of God's bountiful blessings than by spending time with an open Bible and this daily devotional? May God use this work to bring you to a deeper understanding of the riches of His grace in Christ Jesus. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.